All right, let's talk about respiratory system today. Um, this is a topic that is obviously relevant to the cardiology work that you've done. Uh, the interplay between those systems is, is uh, obviously very, very tight. But the oxygenation that happens in the lung, that of course uh, affects how every other organ operates, not just in obvious ways in terms of getting oxygen to the tissue so that it lives, but, but very, very uh, uh, complex and important pH regulation aspects that we'll talk about uh, that would surprise you how, how tightly linked they are, and uh, a whole host of other issues. So this is a, a pretty uh, exciting and important, important lecture. Any announcements before we get going? Is there anything okay? Um, it's diary Okay. <laughs> Awesome. It's a highly worthy announcement. Thank you. All right, so let's talk about the respiratory system. And we'll talk about the physiology, the anatomy, how that plays into the diffusion and the task that it's uh, trying to achieve. And then we'll get very quickly to disorders and their treatments and some of the exciting opportunities for uh, engineers. You know, the, uh, the timing of loss of Respiratory function is very crucial, as you know. This is uh, what happens if you stop oxygenating, if you have respiratory failure for any reason. Uh, and actually, not commonly known, but the first thing that happens is before you get to brain damage, the, the heart starts to be dysfunctional. When you have uh, poor oxygenation, uh, you start to have a higher risk of arrhythmia, altered uh, conduction. You can imagine how that might be the case in a structure that says, uh, finely tuned in terms of timing and the directed flow of electrical activity uh, th through the heart, you actually have a very serious problem early on in the first minute or so. Then, of course, brain damage, uh, the next uh, very serious issue that happens, and that's because the brain does not have uh, uh, a capability for dealing with non-oxygen dependent metabolism in the way that other tissues do. It has very high metabolic demands. That uh, issue becomes uh, irritable. So extremely important uh, and a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, there are more subtle intermediate states that can happen. So at some level, the whole setup of the respiratory system is to deal with uh, this uh, exact problem, the diffusional issue. You have to get gas exchange working. Uh, you have to create a surface area for gas exchange, and basically the uh, it's not just the surface area, it's the, uh, not just the area available for diffusion, but it's the concentration gradients that are relevant for the gases. That's going to set a diffusion rate. Uh, the rate of uh, transfer of material is, turns out to be proportional to the area. To a diffusion coefficient, if you've got uh, obstruction, or you've got fibrosis, or you've got mucus, you've got occlusion of that uh, pathway, that's going to increase your diffusion. Uh, and then, of course, it's the concentration gradients. That are. Typically, when you think about evolution and structure of the respiratory system, you're, you're trying to maximize the surface area, and you're trying to, to decrease distance that's required. Now, different organisms, of course, need respiratory systems. Others do not. Uh, and this is sort of the surface area to volume ratio as you look at different organism sizes. Uh, and you can see there's this uh, uh, obviously very pronounced change. Flies do not need an, an active uh, uh, lung-based system. They uh, do have the inflow pathways for gases to enter into the um, uh, side of the organism. Of course, if you get very small, you've got extremely high surface area. It becomes much a, more acute for larger organisms. So the lungs are a beautiful way of using branching uh, to create high surface area. You've got 
uh, the trachea, the main uh, inflow pathway, it branches right and left main stem bronchi, and then those go into bronchioles, which uh, further uh, till they become terminal bronchioles, and ultimately in a sac, an alveolar sac, which is a out pouchings of this uh, terminal bronchi. Each of those alveolar sacs or alveoli is very heavily invested with capillaries, of course, because that's the uh, gas exchange uh, to be happening. But and they need to be uh, right next to each other. The scales are interesting uh, to think about uh, in terms of uh, the progression uh, from the trachea uh, down to the alveoli. between the job is just a conduction or transmission of, uh, of the gases and then get to the much smaller structures, the alveolar ducts and the alveolar sacs. That's where uh, the tissue is clearly set up, not just for conduction, but for uh, this direct gas exchange uh, with the fluid. So what does that air-blood interface look like? If you think about it, that's pretty hard. You've got a blood vessel and you've got a sac of air. How do you bring them? close together, maximally close together, uh, to create the shortest possible distance for diffusion to happen. It's pretty amazing how close it gets. So this, this is a beautiful image, this electron micrograph that really, uh, what is this? This is a capillary. EN stands for endothelial cell. This is the nucleus of the endothelial cell, EN. This trace around the membrane, this is the capillary, and this is the inside of the capillary capillary lumen or sphincter. It's, it's basically a cell. Your final capillary is just a cell. The nucleus is squashed off to one side. And look how thin endothelial uh, cell uh, actually is. Uh, and this is the inside of it. This is, what is this here, do you think? Black thing? Blood cell, maybe? Sort of a deformed, squashed red blood cell. And then what's going on here? Well. This, you know, you've got your endothelial cell nucleus, uh, and then you've got an epithelial cell that's the uh, uh, cell that's providing some structure to the blood vessel. Here is your gas. This is the, uh, look at the distance. This is pretty amazing. This, this is the two cell membranes that are maximally squashed uh, to, to uh, transition across, and then you've got your inside a blood vessel and the, the red blood. That's how it's set up, extremely uh, beautifully designed. Now, then you've got to think about the uh, effective uh, pressure differentials, the, the equivalent of a concentration gradient as a partial pressure uh, differential in the respiratory system. About the uh, various pressures that are involved at atmospheric pressure, 760 millimeters. You've got, uh, you know, a chiefly large, very large composition of nitrogen, some oxygen, very small uh, contribution from those partial pressures sum up to give you uh, atmospheric pressure. Uh, but it's not, you know, so, so your oxygen is actually um, a minority component, but it's actually even less because the air in your lung is humidified, and so you've got a water uh, partial pressure as well, and that's about to be uh, pretty significant. So uh, when you factor all these things in the partial pressure of inspired oxygen, you take a hit from the humidification, and it's about 150 uh, millimeters of O2 partial pressure of the air that's uh, sitting here. So that's one thing you're, you're thinking about in terms of the, the gas. Then some other, another separate principle that's involved is, is the uh, pressures that are keeping the alveolar uh, sacs inflated that are uh, inflating uh, pressure and volume. Uh, this is to keep in mind in the course of the class is the simple pressure volume relationship. So things uh, NRT don't change much in the course of normal uh, life, but pressure and volume change. Okay, so now let's think about the passage of blood along a capillary near an alveolar sac. And let's think about what's happening as it goes uh, along uh, its progression. It's sort of analogous to our discussion of the kidney, thinking about uh, 
the blood vessel going through the glomerular uh, tuft as it's exposed to Bowman's capsule, what's happening to the various concentrations of things as it goes, and those change as you go along. Same thing here. You've got your uh, capillary passing by an alveolar sac. That's coming out, obviously, a simplified. And let's think about the timings. Well, it takes, you know, less than a second for the blood in the capillary to, to pass by the alveolar sac. So that's not much time. Okay. Uh, so what's happening in this uh, time? It's from the point of view of a red blood cell that's transitioning from... Well, you've got two processes going on. You've got a perfusion rate, which is how blood is passing through the capillary. And then you've got a diffusion process, gas exchange going on as, as that... Uh, Different gases have different diffusion rates, and not just subtly, massively different. And that creates this fundamental distinction between is the change of a gas diffusion limited or perfusion limited. Let's start with carbon monoxide as an extreme. So, it, the, the interesting thing about carbon monoxide, it's uh, what we say it's diffusion limited. It never reaches a very high Partial pressure rises very slowly. It has a very high affinity for hemoglobin quickly, but it no, the, the partial pressure never reaches the maximal level that's present uh, uh, in the alveolar sac because of that. So um, uh, it rises uh, very slowly. Opposite, nitrous oxide has nothing to bind to. It's completely inert as far as the blood is concerned, and so it partial uh, pressure uh, matching the blood and the air very quickly. And oxygen is somewhere in between. O2 is somewhere in between. Uh, and depending on how well the diffusion is happening, the membranes uh, represented the endothelial and epithelial uh, barriers uh, in different disease states or mucus production states and so on. You can or abnormal oxygen, but you can see you can trans transition from something. It's a concept that turns out to be very important uh, uh, clinically. And different uh, graphical ways of, of representing uh, this finally is, is comparing the oxygen, which is sort of analogous to what I just showed you, and then last major gas to think about, which is carbon dioxide, and that is also riding on this transition of perfusion diffusion limitation. Uh, normally, you lose all the carbon dioxide that can be lost when you match the alveolar carbon dioxide pressure. You lose that about halfway through the capillary. Obviously, you're not going to go below that. You can't lose carbon dioxide to a lower pressure than it low as you can go when things equilibrate. But if there's any abnormality to that process, then uh, you can end up with still some CO2 in your capillary after it's uh, left the action zone with the... So oxygen and carbon dioxide live in that uh, uh, region. Then there are other interesting things that happen inside the red blood cell itself that have to be kept in mind. Now here's where this whole pH issue So, um, you've got your red blood cell, and you've got oxygen and carbon dioxide sloshing around outside. Uh, oxygen passes more or less freely across the membrane. It interacts with hemoglobin. Okay. Takes you from deoxygenated to oxygenated uh, hemoglobin. Relatively straightforward. Carbon dioxide is a little more complicated, so it can diffuse pretty freely, but it reacts with water uh, in, a, in a manner that's uh, catalyzed by a very important carbonic anhydrase. And that creates carbonic acid, which then immediately creates a proton, and so you're acidifying inside of your red blood cell. Now that's good in a way, that lets your, you know, that has a couple uh, actually important things. First of all, that can actually uh, alter the hemoglobin properties in an important way. 
uh, affect the oxygen uh, affinity. But also, you've got to think about uh, you know, what this does. This, this process, this carbonic anhydrase, is present not only in red blood cells, but it's present in other body tissues. You've got this exchange of CO2 and acidity that affects how basically every organ in the body operates. Here, uh, if you have a process that greatly elevates your carbon dioxide, not breathing enough, carbon dioxide is building up, you're going to become acidotic. You're going to have increased acid uh, basically everywhere because of this process, because of this type of facilitated uh, production. This would be what you might call a respiratory acidosis. Okay? You're not breathing enough. You're not losing enough carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is building up and becoming acidotic. And any problem associated with acid anywhere in your body can be a consequence of respiratory acidosis. Now, you, you can have the opposite. You could have a respiratory alkalosis. If you breathe too quickly, you're going to be blowing off too much carbon dioxide, and you're going to get to lower levels of CO2. That will actually drive your pH potentially harmfully in the other direction. What kind of things might make you breathe quickly? Panic attack, absolutely. That's always high on the differential. It's amazing how often that happens. Altitude, sure, yeah. If you're detecting uh, uh, that sort of uh, uh, happen, that actually can happen. Certainly altitude changes can happen. You can also, here's another final interesting thing. It can be in response to um, a metabolic problem. And so you can have elevated acid that's occurring uh, due to a, a metabolic process, you can have a metabolic acidosis, then you can have a respiratory compensation. Your body's smart enough to say, hey, we've got a, a great way to uh, uh, get rid of uh, excess acid. We can breathe more quickly, and we can drop CO2 and, and compensate for acidosis that way. And so that, that becomes a very interesting thing. You can have someone who's breathing very quickly because their body's responding to a acidosis that started from a completely separate non-respiratory so that is a respiratory compensation to a metabolic acidosis. So you can start to see the sort of complexity that goes on, and it can work the other way, too, uh, in important uh, ways. Uh, and we'll get into uh, questions that help you sort of sort through these, these differences. Okay, now you've got to think about the difference between what's going on in the lung target tissue. So uh, this curve, the hemoglobin saturation curve, is a very important curve. What's plotted here is partial pressure of oxygen, x-axis, and percent saturation of hemoglobin on the y-axis. Get from 100% to 0%. First thing you notice is it's nonlinear. It's got a cooperativity to it. The Hill coefficient describes this. Um, than one. And what that does is it allows uh, a, a very efficient unloading of uh, oxygen in tissue. Okay. And so under normal operation, the hemoglobin becomes uh, completely saturated. Or, uh, basically, every hemoglobin is fully occupied by oxygen. In tissue, the partial pressure of oxygen is actually obviously much less than it would be in the lung. That facilitates the unloading of hemoglobin. And see there's a fair bit of reserve. So actually most hemoglobin is not unloaded uh, fully by the time it leaves uh, the uh, Reserve uh, can lead to substantial tolerance to uh, but it's not uh, uh, 